In this place where loneliness festers and desire is a haunting, unforgotten sign of life, Wallace Peebles knows that Gregory has been sent as an answer to her prayers. He bears himself as though in the other life before this place he had mastered his world. If she had not tried one too many times to leave on her own without her family knowing where she was headed, she would still be in her apartment in the senior citizen's complex. She knew where she wanted to go, told the taxi drivers to take her to Woodward and Lothrop downtown on 11th and G Street. But they all said what her nephew Kevin told her, that Woodward and Lothrop, where she worked as a milliner for 20 years, was torn down years ago. All she wants to do is go to Woody's and see one of her hats in the window. All her life, she has loved hats. A woman became a lady, a queen in a hat. Her success at Woody's inspired her to open her own shop with money borrowed from her sister and brother. A tiny place squeezed in between a tailor shop and a Chinese carryout on T Street, not far from the Howard Theater. There she flourished for a while, but then when women started wearing short skirts, pants, and stopped wearing hats, only the Sunday church ladies came to her shop. So she had to go back to Woody's, but it was there that she became the lead designer and made hats for the rich white ladies who gave society parties in Georgetown and on Capitol Hill, the wives of congressmen and senators. She retired, was living on Social Security and her savings. Then she began to yearn for who she used to be. She'd get up in the morning and after her coffee, her bowl of oatmeal, orange juice and her pills, she would spend an hour or more picking out just the right dress, shoes and hat. Satisfied with the ensemble, she'd spray her neck and arms with a mist of Jean Nate, and, giddy with a sense of purpose, lock the door behind her and go out looking for her life. But the city had been turned upside down, made her feel like she was Alice in Wonderland. Nothing was where it used to be. She never forgot her address. She always knew where she, was, she lived. She just had no idea where she was going. She'd ride the bus she thought was headed to Georgetown and ring the bell to disembark and stand on a street in Brooklyn. Sometimes she left her apartment without her wallet. Twice a stranger finding her sobbing on a street corner flagged down a police car. When the police officers escorted her into the lobby of her building, she felt famous. Her nephew Kevin took over her finances and her life and brought her here, he said, so she would be safe, so he would always know where she was. Now opening her eyes in her small room every morning, she sees the beautiful hats lining the shelves, hats she had made, hats born of her hands, hats that were her assignment from God. More and more she cannot remember who she made the hats for. Every hat always had a story, but the stories are beginning to fade. She loves the Bible study with a cheerful blonde lady who always remembers everyone's name and asks them to fill in the missing word when she reads phrases from the Bible. Wallace can still recite the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. She has prayed all her life, and her prayers became more fervent after no one wanted to buy her hats and there seemed nothing left in this life or this world to do except to wander. She still knows how to pray, and she knows God has answered her prayers because of this man who roams the halls naked at night as though dropped from heaven.